Hear now the reading for this day. This is the third installment in a little sermon series I'm doing this Lent on questions the Bible asks. You may remember the a couple weeks ago, if you were here, the question was one Jesus asked of the disciples. Who do you say that I am? Last week, it was a question God asked of Adam and Eve in the garden. Where are you? And when they were hiding. And now, uh, this passage is not a question God asks of a human, but a question the, the human asks of God. Uh, here it is in the story of Moses' call. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he called and had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign for you that, is who I, that it is I who sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. One of the things that I find most appealing about the Bible as a resource for living is the fact that very seldom does the Bible read like a textbook or a book on philosophy. It's not that I have anything against textbooks or philosophy either, but uh, what I mean to say by that is for the most part, the Bible doesn't give us religious wisdom by dealing with abstractions or arguments, for instance, about the existence of God. 
you can find little glimmers of those kinds of things, a little hints here and there uh, of, of arguments for God's existence. The psalm, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. But, but for the most part, you, you don't find uh, an abstract argument for God, you know, uh, why you should believe in this or this particular expression of faith as opposed to some other way of looking at things. What I love most about the Bible is that it doesn't deal in abstractions, but it gives us lots of stories of people, which is helpful to me because I'm a person who likes to hear stories. And in the Bible, you, you see these all the time. People who meet God, they talk to God, they have adventures that God sends them on, and through these adventures, somehow, they are brought closer to God. God becomes more real to them. And it's in those stories of people oftentimes insecure people, certainly oftentimes flawed people, that's, the Bible says, where faith, God works to make faith real. You know, we see these characters doing the things that we do, praying and pleading with God sometimes, sometimes arguing with God, frequently asking questions of God. And one of those stories, one of the oldest and best stories of God's interaction with a person, I would suggest to you, is this story of Moses and the burning bush. And the question Moses asked of God in light of the calling that Moses receives as he stands there and has this chat as the bush burns beside him and refuses to be consumed. It's that question that Moses asked by firelight, uh, which I have chosen as the subject of this uh, third uh, in the series, Questions the Bible Asks. But before we get to the question, let me just remind you, first of all, what a great and interesting life Moses had. He had one of the more satisfying lives of anybody, as I think. You, you may recall that as an infant, Moses was abandoned by his Jewish parents to save his life. And he was placed in the reed basket. You remember this from Bible school. His mother puts him in the reed basket and uh, they, sends him adrift in the backwaters of the Nile River, and there he is rescued uh, by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. And of course, what that means for Moses is that he is all of a sudden royalty. He is raised in the, in the royal palatial household, and, and as he grew, he would become a kind of rising star in the Egyptian establishment. But all that changes, you may remember, on the day when Moses sees a slave driver, literally a, an Egyptian taskmaster, beating one of the Hebrew slaves mercilessly, and, and his conscience is overwhelmed. And in a fit of rage, Moses kills the Egyptian slave driver and consequently is forced to run for his life. It's in the process of his being a fugitive that Moses meets his future wife, Zipporah, whom he marries and settles down with far away from Egypt, going into uh, the livestock business. His father-in-law, Jethro, uh, had a big flock, and, and Moses became one of Jethro's farmhands. And that history gets us up to the story which I read to you today. It's while Moses is doing his everyday job, he's out in the field watching sheep, his life now, after that early conflict and danger, really, of being pursued by uh, Pharaoh for having killed a taskmaster, his, now his life is all settled down. He's on an even keel. Things are going well. He's come through it all. And he's out in the field just another regular day, and that's when he sees that bush. What a curious thing. The bush is burning. It's not seem like it's not burning up. So the story says... He does what any normal person would do. He goes over to have a closer look, and, and the voice comes. Take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy ground, for I am speaking to you. I, the God of your ancestors. And then what follows, as you just heard, is God's announcement to Moses that tending sheep is not going to be the, the, the last call he gets in his life. He says, I've got a plan. And to Moses, it had to have sounded like an utterly outrageous scheme. Go back to Egypt, where you're a wanted man and where there is a, a price on your head. Go back to Egypt 
and free the Jewish slaves, all of them who are being held there. I have heard their cry, God says. Come, I will send you to bring them out. Moses, safe now, happy, contented, nice family, good prospects for his future. He responds to this call with the question any logical person would ask. Who am I that I should go and do that? Who am I to undertake such an audacious thing as this? And the response comes back, I'll go with you. It's worth pointing out that that answer, I'll go with you, doesn't really respond to the original question. He didn't ask, who will go with me? He said, who am I? Me, Moses, to go back and fight the, Egyptian, the mighty Egyptian army, Ramses, the great pharaoh, and all of the war machine that Ramses has together. I am the one. I, who am I to do that? And, and that exchange, that, that exchange, in my opinion, that points to one of the greatest and most repeated themes in the Bible. You really, if you think about it, this story is told probably... 30 different times in the Bible, only the names are changed uh, in terms of uh, how it plays out. The story of God coming to some regular person and calling them to do some significant, meaningful thing, uh, it, that happens from front to back in this book, and as, as does the response that God gets all the time when he asks, there's got to be somebody better than me. Who am I to do this? Uh, there's got to be somebody smarter, stronger, more faithful, more capable, somebody who's got more resources. Who am I that I should go? Think maybe of Abraham and Sarah. Maybe that's the first call in the whole Bible. Abraham and Sarah, they are uh, in retirement age. In uh, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, they have a ranch there. They're comfortable. They've lived their lives, or so they think, uh, late in years. And God says, I'm going to call you to be parents of a great nation. Your descendants shall be numerous as the stars. The story says, Sarah can't help but laugh. Uh, and she denies it. Oh, I didn't, I didn't laugh. And God says, oh, I saw you laugh. And by the way, your son will be named Isaac, right? The, the Hebrew word for laughter, kind of God sharing the glorious joke uh, that will be true. Uh, who are we at, 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 in the retirement home of the Chaldees uh, called to be parents of a great nation? Or think, just turn over a few pages, think about God calling Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos, the, the, the three great prophets. None of them particularly religious people. Isaiah says, I can't be a prophet. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm not a very spiritual guy. In fact, my language leaves something to be desired. Or, or Jeremiah, I can't go be a prophet because I am only a youth. Nobody will pay any attention to me. Or Amos, I'm not a prophet. I'm I'm a tree trimmer. I'm a dresser of sycamore trees. I'm blue collar. Nobody's going to want to hear anything from me about religion or theology or faith. The Old Testament's full of those stories. It's just the, just the faces change. Who am I that I should go? And the same is true for the Gospels. You know, Jesus approaches fishermen, of all people, fishermen on the beach, and says, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Follow, leave your nets, leave your business, and, I will, and follow me, and you'll change the world. Us? There's got to be somebody better. It's not an overstatement. I would suggest to you to say this is the most repeating theme you can find in the Bible. It just plays out like this. God says to somebody, I need you to do this, and the response is, I'm not qualified. Somebody got to be somebody better to do this than me. And, and also, what happens next is repeated too. God says, I know, but I'm going with you. I know, but I'm going with you. Um, it was Norman Cousins, the great writer, uh, who once commented that when emotional paralysis comes into any life, uh, it tends to come not so much out of the mammoth size of the problem that we're facing, but out of what Cousins called the puniness 
of our sense of self and purpose. And he went on to say that for him, the real tragedy of, of human existence is not that we die. He says that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is to come to your, your moment of death without ever having grasped your full power in life, which is the power that comes, he says, from knowing no matter how ordinary you are, no matter how flawed you are, how lacking in faith, how weak we all can sometimes be, we all have this power within us to live for something greater than ourselves and to do some little piece for the upbuilding of the common good and for the love of others who will come after us. I think about that. Maybe that accounts for why the early Christians built cathedrals, you know, cathedrals that took hundreds of years to build some of the big cathedrals in Europe, I, I read uh, some of the stained glass windows, like in Notre Dame, just the window itself took more than 200 years to build. Think about that 200 years to build the window. So, so one person would spend their whole career, adult, their whole adult life, 40 years, I'm building this window. And they'd get, you know, 20% of the way up, and, and their son or, would come and build 20, you know, for 200 years for a window. But, but it was, the early Christians had this call, you know, who, who are we to build a cathedral? Well, we all build it one little bit at a time. And I think about that. We don't build cathedrals like that anymore in, in modern times. Uh, uh, the closest I could think of is, uh, are you familiar with the Crazy Horse Monument out in South Dakota? Have you ever been out there? It's right by Mount Rushmore, just a few miles away from Mount Rushmore is the Crazy Horse Monument. Uh, they are planning their 70th anniversary celebration of the beginning of the Crazy Horse Monument uh, this coming year. It's been, that's how long it's been, 70 years that they have been working on this monument. Um, I have seen it uh, four times, I think, through my life. I think I saw it first when I was a boy of five years old. And I remember we had gone to Mount Rushmore and how, you know, that's so cool. You see that Mount, all the presidents are there. And then, now we're going to go and see where, where they have cr the mountain that they're putting Crazy Horse, the Indian chief. And, and uh, I remember being so excited and then going and seeing it, and it looked like nothing. I mean, you couldn't even, they, they had like one little hole punched through the mountain where the arm was going to go. Uh, and I remember thinking, well, this doesn't look like anything. The, the, the monument was the vision of a man named Korczak Julkowski a Polish sculptor uh, who had, had emigrated from Poland and settled in South Dakota in the 1940s. And he hadn't been here very long, the story is, where he was approached by some Native American friends of his. They had seen Mount Rushmore and they wanted to do something similar honoring uh, a, a Native American, uh, like the four presidents were honored there. They told him that Chief Crazy Horse, this, this brave, intelligent warrior, would be the logical choice for such a monument as that. And that was 1947. And they've been chipping away at this ever since. Uh, here's where they are now. Can you show the photo? Here's, where, here's what it looks like now. You can see his, can you see his face. When I was a kid, you could just see the hole through the wall, and that, the rest of that was just mountain. But they've got this far in 70 years. Korchev Czech Dukovsky, he died in 1983, and his kids have taken this up. And if you go, you know, they just have a visitor center, and they'll, they'll put, like, you can put 20 bucks in it. They, don't, they raise money just privately. There's no, or there's no government funding for it or anything. Here's where they're trying to get. Can you show? Can you show? What, what? That's what they want it to look like. So they, 70 years to get, now we got his nose, and we got an eye, and we got a, we got a hole through the mountain. 70 years. They've been doing this, uh, and, and they have, uh, the, the, the sons and the, the grandsons are now carrying on. And when I see the size of, I see where they're trying to go and how far they've gotten in 70 years, I have to say, do, do you wonder, don't, don't you wish that some, some days they had chosen a smaller mountain? I, I would think that. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the Black Hills, so maybe they should have picked a hill rather than, rather than a mountain. Uh, but, but no, Korczak Jolkowski chose a mountain to match what he thought would be the moral and the spiritual dimensions of the Native American people as incarnated in Crazy Horse. 
And, and when you see that, uh, it, 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 you know, you think with a project of that scope, who cares if it takes a century or two to complete? It's like, it's like a cathedral. It's working out a faith and a commitment to something greater than oneself that in the long run will, will matter to others and, and ultimately make a monument that, that is, is fitting and, 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 a, and a glory to God. So when I think of things like this, and I think about Moses' call, you know, he seems, he seems like this big in comparison to the mountain of a project that God wanted him to take. Uh, it, it makes me ask, you know, what am I chipping away at uh, in my life? You know, what are you chipping away at? Are we devoting time and energy and substance to things that matter? You know, it's so easy to just get caught up in the everyday things, you know, getting groceries and uh, all the, just the normal stuff of life. What are we doing to chip away at projects that are greater than ourselves, that will continue to bless when we're long gone? Uh, what, what dream of size is reaching you these days and calling you to grow? It's not far-fetched. I'm not talking about going to build a uh, a statue on a mountain necessarily. There are all kinds of ways you can contribute. You can chip away at greatness uh, right here in this community. Uh, yesterday morning I was asked to go over uh, to uh, the west side of Bloomington and say a prayer of dedication for the uh, expansion of the Habitat for Humanity Restore shop. They, 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 they're going to double the size of that and they had the groundbreaking yesterday morning and I was asked to come over, as I sometimes am in the community, to give the prayer of blessing for the groundbreaking. And in doing that, I thought, well, I ought to do just a little bit of research. I always like to kind of know. I, and I knew that the local chapter of Habitat had been around for a good while. Uh, the, the Restore set basically provides some funding for Habitat. They sell used furniture, donated furniture, and things like that. And the proceeds from that they use to help fund uh, the Habitat chapter. But uh, I did just some checking online about the local Habitat chapter. We've been a part of it here for years. We usually contribute about a quarter of a house, ten or twelve thousand dollars in volunteers to build in partnership with others, like one house a year. But do you know that uh, it's been uh, uh, since 1985 that the McLean County chapter of Habitat for Humanity got started? 1985. And uh, since then, they have built 150 houses. 150 houses. You think about it, it's like a little town. It's like a little town. Uh, 150 houses. If you would have said to me, uh, if somebody would come and say, we'd like you to be a part of uh, putting up a town. We'd like you to build a town. You know, put up the money and the volunteers, you're going to build a town. You'd say, we can't do that. That's too much. <laughs> but you know, lo and behold, it's not too much. Uh, a quarter of a house here, and a quarter of a, you know, a chip here, and a chip there, and lo and behold, uh, here in McLean County, 150 houses. Uh, uh, Stan Geeson, who's one of our members and, and who was part of the dedication, also just made an, an offhand comment, true, true statement, he, that just in, of the spinoff of that, Habitat for Humanity houses have contributed through, the, through property taxes, back to McLean County, 900,000 bucks. Of property taxes going back. It's sort of a kind of wonderful. You think about that. Everybody's been 150 families who needed a place have a place. The community's benefited back as they pay their property taxes. The, the, the 150, 150 little town inside of Bloomington just done one chip at a time. Um, looking back into the uh, trying to tie this back in into into Mo, uh, Moses. Moses was asked to chip away at what he thought was too big. But what he found in doing that was that uh, with God, what he had was actually more than enough. And I notice in the passage that when God reassures Moses of that, he says, you know, I'll be with you. It's going to be all right. Moses has one more question. Moses says, well, if I go and I say God is with me, they are going to say, well, who, what God are you talking about? And when they ask, what should I tell them your name is? Just so that they know this isn't just all about me. And, and the answer comes back, you know it. Tell them I am who I am, which doesn't seem much like an answer. Or the Hebrew can be either translated, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Tell them that. Tell them I am who I am has sent you. And I tried to 
meditate on that a little bit and pray about that and, and wondered, first of all, it's a mysterious name. So maybe that, that all that's involved in that is God is saying, you can't get me pinned down too narrowly. You know, you try to pin me down, I'm going to resist you. I'm just going to give you a, this amorphous answer. I am who I am. And that's probably good advice for any preacher. You know, you, uh, it was Reinhold Niebuhr, the famous theologian, who said, preachers need to be careful about trying to be too specific when they talk about the deep things of God. He said, uh, I, I'm sus uh, suspicious of any preacher who's sure he knows either the, the furniture in heaven or the temperature in hell. Uh, that's pretty good, uh, pretty good caution. Uh, be careful about trying to get God too narrowly pinned down. I am who I am. But I thought more about it. You know, maybe. Maybe uh, it's God's way of saying to Moses, and by extension to us, that when we go ahead and do our part, we can trust that God will be with us in just the way that we need God. You know, we don't all need God in exactly the same way. I think about this. For instance, if we take a chance at something new and we fail, and because of that we need somebody to to, to show up and nurture us and to kind of pat us on the back and, and, and shore up our wounds and, and get us back. God shows up like a mother for us with that word of encouragement and tenderness. Or, or if we need kindness and patience on a project that's not going as well as we'd like and, and we need a rallying cry uh, not to give up, maybe God shows up in that moment like a, like a father or cheerleader who says, go, don't let, don't, don't, keep your chin up. Get out there again, you'll be all right get going. Or if we need somebody to hold us account if we fall away from what we know to be our best self, God shows up like a judge, a judge who loves us and who wants the best for us, wants us to be whole and says, no, nothing doing, not going to let you lay down on the job. If we need somebody to walk beside us when the road is rough, uh, maybe it's God's way of saying, I'll be there like a savior for you. I will be who I will be. And maybe, I would suggest, that's the best possible answer any of us could get. Because what it says, basically, is that when it comes to being faithful, we can trust God to show up as we need it and, and therefore be empowered to, to do the next step, to chip away at one more time at something bigger than just ourselves this week. Will you find your call this week to chip away one more, one more, uh, bite of the hammer. You know, who are we to presume that we could make a difference like that? It's a question that's been asked since the beginning of time. And the answer the Bible gives back is, well, you're children of God. Uh, a God who, who knows the world needs you and uh, who uh, will find through the years when you do your part that you're not alone. And when you trust that, you'd never know how far your reach will go. Amen.